You're listening to Off to Market with Scott Farley and Hamish Chadwick. Hi, I'm Hamish. And I'm Scott. And we're back again with uh, Belinda V.C. Brown from Brandonian and Brio and a number of other companies. I can't even list them all out. Hi, guys. <laughs> uh, this is part, the third part of a three-part series that we're just doing with Belinda. Uh, as I said we, before, she's a wealth of knowledge. And if you're just coming in, it's well worth looking at the other two. Uh, they've got some amazing information on them. Um, today we're going to talk to Belinda about another area of her expertise in marketing, uh, and it's all about connecting um, customers and businesses uh, together through brand archetypes. Can you please tell us, Belinda, <laughs> what a brand archetype is? It's not something you put on your pizza, is it? No, well, I generally try <laughs> not to, so I put on I, pizza. No. <laughs> So, no, um, it's a new word. So, you know, it's something we, we're learning about. So, you know, obviously there's a, there's a bit to it. Um, you've got five minutes to just fill us in. Okay. All right. Glad you gave me a, a, a time That's time limit for that. Yeah. You can have as long as you want. You can have as long as Thanks you want. Thanks for you guys. Uh, so archetypes is the is actually the formal word. It was actually uh, coined by Carl Jung, the Swiss psychiatrist, sort of back in Sigmund Freud days. So um, if you haven't heard of um, Carl Jung. I, again, have been a little bit unnaturally obsessed with Carl Jung, and he describes an archetype as, um, he, he actually had a dream, so he dream state where he went down in sort of like, he called it like the basement of his mind, and it's where um, he said, we're not actually born as a blank slate, so when we're born, we're actually pre-programmed with some data, if you like, you know, in our brain. And some of that is what keeps us alive. So mm. we know what a mother figure is, for oh, yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. We know what uh, a hero could be. Yeah. And and or, or what's funny as in a jester. So he's so saying like a computer program, a computer language, a program. Yeah, that we as humans that, yeah, okay. all are, yeah. are sort of pre-programmed with that I we're not born that. as I mean, that blank slate. Studies about crows that taken away from their parents for years and years and years and years and generations and still build yeah. a nest the same way that they're... they're yes, right. So like you're pre-programmed. Their... Yeah, okay. And yeah. that's what I love about archetypes. So imagine if we are marketing to an audience of these people, these brains, walking around pre-programmed. Yeah. They already have an understanding as to what this archetype is. So an, another word for archetype, archetype, as I said, is the proper word, is like personalities or characteristics. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So from a branding perspective, so when you put brand and archetype together, brand archetype is there's, well, there's 12 that we use. So there's 12 sets and they sit on four key poles of what's the underlying emotional response. Is it to build, um, to give somebody the element of control? So something like a ruler brand. So think the king. Uh, yep. So the king rules the land, the governments yep. rule, or generally rule, you know, what we're doing. And we we feel that they've got that in control. Or we then uh, feel that we are safe to then go about our everyday business knowing that someone else is taking control of that for us. So if I'm going to give you some car analogies as I go through these archetypes, but I do have a little bit of a thing for Fiat's. But, uh, I so to build a house around a Fiat once. I did. It was in my <laughs> dining room. <laughs> Oh, why not, right? Oh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so as a rule, from a ruler archetype perspective, uh, you would it, Mercedes Benz is uh, is a ruler brand, and Mercedes is all about uh, you know high quality. Uh, they're generally the most innovative. Uh, they have things on the cars before others yeah. others do, and you pay a premium for that. And so, as a ruler, they're taking control over even your experience when you go in um, to have your car service. They will give you a you know, a car to, to take away. So they're 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 controlling every aspect of yeah. of that. But it's it's a it's a quality product. And I, I read somewhere this is a bit of offside, sorry, it's gonna take up your five minutes, but Mercedes <laughs> has this archetype of being reliable as well. And it's because they were in an area which was rough and ready. And so they had to make the things bulletproof so that they lasted. Mm. And that's where they got the reliability and it was became part of their DNA. So with reliability BMW comes control. was in a very an area with lots of winding roads, so they made their, car, their, their cars become sporty. And so it stuck, the DNA stuck with them. It was almost by, by location. Yeah, and so this is probably so, before it, they were aware yeah, of how they positioned they, as a they, brand as an they, archetype. They've actually kept it in there because they know that's what, what people have bought for that reason, and then they've run it through. Well, you know, you think of IBM and um, some of those uh, types of businesses where they actually set the rules for a whole new industry. 
mm. right? And they set the rules by which others play. Yep. And that is very much um, about what a real archetype is. We do a barbershop. It's actually the oldest barbershop in the world. Um, and we did this brand strategy for them, and they're a ruler brand. Because, you know, and this is an English brand, it's called mm. True Fit and Hill, and they, um, Winston Churchill used to go there. True Fit. Be, True Fit and Hill is the name True of the Fit brand. And Hill. Okay. We, we're just starting to bring them, we're helping the client bring them into Australia here, but then they're all around the world. But okay. started in, yeah. um, in the, the, the store is in London. Mm. And so what they're really selling, you know, is uh, confidence. Yeah. So if a man feels the part, if it, so if he looks the part, he feels the part. Yeah. And when he feels the part, he is the part. So they're grooming men for greatness. Yeah, okay. But they um, have the best products. They have the best chairs, the best barbers. You know, everything is about being the best. It's the most expensive, probably, haircut you might ever have, Scott, if yeah. you ever go. Yeah. Um, you know, but it's it's about the way that you feel I'm when you come out of there. I don't need a haircut. <laughs> 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 I just don't want to go in my basement as far as subconscious because it'd be dirty down there. <laughs> it'd be messy. I mean, need a damn hoover down that way. But you can see, though, as a brand, though, when they're talking about, well, we're grooming men for greatness and we have the best products and the best service, they need to continually innovate because people are always trying to copy what they're doing. Yeah. The same as Mercedes Benz. You know, with technology they bring in, you know, they have to continually innovate. Yeah. And that's, you know, then that's what a, yeah. a ruler brand is. Okay. Then you've got, you know, another brand we were talking before, uh, like the creator. So a creator brand is like Dyson. Mm. You know, he has created a whole new way that we, you know, dry our hands. We dry our hair now. I still don't know. The vacuum was the first, wasn't it? The first thing he came yeah, up with. Yeah, the vacuum. Well, actually, the first thing was a, a ball barrow. Really? So it was a wheelbarrow with a round, a spherical wheel oh, on it. So you could tip it, it sideways. And that's how he oh, initially started yeah, making money. And then, those. and then. He's um, known for his. Uh, Vacuums. Yeah, and then he did the vacuum, which yes. he had to sell fund. He had to sell fund because he went no to all the big companies right. and they just wouldn't uh, but, you know, have a bar himself. Him. Backed himself and look, you know, his product isn't the best on the market by any means. It's almost prototype level. Some of the stuff he puts out there, but the the, the way it works is phenomenal. We, we bought one, and I, and I hate the economics of it, but I love the way it functions. Mm. It really yeah. does. It's a it's a, a whole leap ahead. It's a whole new way, next. and that's that's the creator archetype. Is if you know, if you can think it, we will create it. Mm, and then it's mm. about, it, you know, we talk about the buying behavior for creator type products is that it's something that is smart. So Alessi, you know, that really cool yes. little mm. juicer, juicer, you mm. know, that the little crazy legs on the side. Oh, I've got one. Yeah, yeah and it yeah. drips it down, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, but that's, that's, yeah. that's a, you know, it's yeah. a whole new way, but it's something yeah. it's got, it's got a cool story, and, it. you yeah. know, and it's, visually, um, visually yeah, very, it's very, visually. Well, it's, it's more of an ornament than a, I actually used mine last night. Oh, did you really? Enough. That's For awesome. the first time in about six months, I thought, oh, I've got that. It's not just a funny And didn't you feel thing. that, you know, it's very cool, it's very creative and... Well, it's actually quite useful. Actually functionally it works very, very well. useful. Yeah. yeah, because it's... The other juicer I've got is this... It's bigger. So it's it's actually... Yeah, the, the, the Alessi one is actually very functional. So mm. it's that function and form yeah. is, is married so well. Yeah. It's one yeah. part. And but it'll never break. Like, it's so... It, they're made it's so rough. well. Form and function, that one is yeah. just... And that's why it's so nice, I think. But the creator is, uh, you know, there's traps with each of these too. So as Carl Jung um, defined uh, archetypes, he also talked about the shadow. Mm -hmm. So the the shadow, by understanding what your archetype is and you align it to a brand, so as we were talking Alessi, we're talking, you know, Dyson as a creator, there's also a shadow or a trap. So with a creator in particular, it's where you, as the creator, you keep developing. And this is why I'm telling you the story because it's really mm. um, good for if you're developing a product. You are the creator of it. So you think Dyson, like he, he could have gone, you know, to the nth degree. Oh, I've just got to test a bit more. Oh, I just got to, because the trap is that it's a little bit of you going out in the market with something, but what if the market don't like it? Yeah. I'm going to put that feeling off. Like, I don't like rejection as yeah, a creator. No, I'm just going to stop that for a while. So really I'll, I'll continue to make excuses as to why I keep needing to create back yeah, here, yeah. right? And now you're actually to the point where you then don't get your mar your product to market. We I see it all the time. I, I equate would. it to coming to the top of a hill when you're running and you, the hardest yards are the last because you're nearly there, but you've still got so far to go and it's the hardest part. And I see them putting obstacles, all sorts of obstacles. Because obstacles it's actually... Oh, I haven't got my pain in place. I haven't got this in place. All these things. I mean, they, these things should have been put in place early in the piece, and they just haven't been because they're putting these delays up there. It's really obvious to me. Well, and maybe I do it myself. You... I'm doing it right now with a product I'm relaunching. Oh, really? Yep. I'm just petrified of making the wrong decision, and I just have to just get over rejected. it and just have a shot at it. 
Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. But, it, you know, by overcoming that... It takes that, a lot of courage to develop it. Mm, by overcoming that, um, to overcome that, you need to first understand that that's the possibility, right? Mm. So then you set the boundaries at the beginning. I am going to send it to market when we reach this point. So it's almost like you've given yourself permission yeah. to go out to something that you know is not maybe 100% there, yep. but you need to get that proven concept because yep. you need to know if it's viable, yep. right? So you need, yep. to, you need to just get it out. Yep. And that is the trap of a creator. Yep. So Carl Jung was really smart in how he talked about yeah, archetypes. Definitely. And I, I, I can go around and introduce you to all of them, but I'll, I'll just pick out a few just in the essence of sure. time so we can talk about them in more detail. But um, what, what I like about that aligning to the brand is that you've then got people out there that associate or have this understanding of. Yeah. If it resonates them, so this is why you then you link it to the need because then that brings them into that buying decision. But they're all going to have a deeper understanding as to who you are and what you do yeah. by assigning that archetype because we're, we're bored with it. So let me take hero brand. You know, There's lots of really good examples of hero brands you think of the australian army they're there when you need them you know you're thinking of so, the night so if your message is not life. hero you're out, you're lost you cannot you cannot sell that product if you're if you're selling the red cross type situation you're an army your message is totally wrong so you've got to you got to make sure that you tie the message in to what the actual yes archetype. but if you are see this is what i i see people who so say oh we're the there when you is. want us you know well you actually need to fashion all of your products and services around you know, yeah. being able to be there when people need you. Yeah. So there's there's a lot um, there's a lot on just business structures and, and, and that side. But also, if you say that you're going to be there, then you need 24 hour, you know, seven yeah. day a week, you know, availability. And your business model may not even support that. So it means you yeah. can't own a yeah. hero brand. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And so it is about being clear on what is, and then you need to look at the the, the, the product landscape. So if you're selling, you know, a a a, a, sh- a type of shoe, right? And and you look at, you plot well, all the other products, your competitors in the market and their price points, mm. and you start to work out maybe what their archetype is. Like Colorado was very much an explorer type. You put the shoe yeah. on, you can go anywhere. Yeah. Nike is hero. You know, you put it on, you can, you know, you can just do it. Mm. You know, it's almost like you've got a superpower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but if you want to go up against Nike and they really are owning the hero brand, then you need to you need to then pick a different one to have that competitive advantage. And that's where the strategy side comes in. Okay. So then you go, well, this the archetype gives me the competitive advantage, but I fulfill on the need this way because the under like the underlying emotional response is still quite clear within each of the archetypes, yeah, okay. if that all makes sense. Yeah, it does. So... Um, so Another really interesting one, which I think your audience will um, associate with, is the the rebel. And I, as I said, I, I love rebel brands. I seem to have attracted a lot of them, and they are all about uh, challenging convention. Yeah. So just because it's been done this way for the last fifty years, doesn't mean that that is the only way, right? Yeah. And yeah. so you know, Apple are very much you know challenging the way yeah. that we we think about or consume products, even the whole store experience. They were challenging that. Uh, you know, we did a, uh, you'll like this one, Scott, we did a, 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 a brand which is Ladies Bras. Yeah, and um, <laughs> Ladies Bras, very good quality. One of my motivators. <laughs> oh, yeah. My, 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 <laughs> I know my guys love working on deep etching those bras, going to those photo shoots. Yes, <laughs> women bras. Uh, but when we, when we positioned testing that. testing required then. <laughs> <laughs> High quality. We, my wife's going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> High quality product. Get it all um, out. <laughs> high quality, lots of, you know, features and benefits, you yeah. know, but but a user of a, you know, someone who's going to buy a bra that's worth, you know, around the $100 mark mm. is, is expecting quality anyway. So yeah. I always say that you need to check on what does your audience already expect? Yeah. So don't try and tell me something that I already expect to receive. Yeah. So if I'm sp- spending $100 on a bra, then I want it to be supportive. I want it to be, you know, something that lasts, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I want it to also look relatively nice. So these were sports bras. And we wanted to think about, well, how do we position this in the market? We could put it anywhere. So mm. there's, you know, they're going up against Burley and some of the, I don't know how much you guys know about bra brands. feel a bit weird here talking about bra brands, but you're all right. <laughs> uh, you know, how um, we, we wanted that, that position of that woman who maybe couldn't get uh, something from the other brands. And yep. so where we came to was women with large breasts. So we wanted to create a bra that was in sizes that was not really readily available in some of the, the more you know commercial brands. Yep. Because a lot of those women need to be supported because they need to do exercise. Maybe they like horse riding, playing tennis. There's some of those sports you know have 
just by the nature of the sport has a little bit more yeah, movement yeah. that you need support in. Yeah. So we so their their product offering is that they now manufacture bras that are larger sizes. And for the Australian market, we're talking about, you know, it's held, not held back, is our tagline that we've come up for them. Yeah. And then the stories that we tell as a challenger brand is about, well, just because you have large breasts, yeah. and we actually call them boobs because that's the, the language in Australia, we call them boobs. So if just because you have large boobs doesn't mean you shouldn't have the right or feel comfortable when you're exercising. Yeah, yeah. And so now we're creating a, a whole community around these, uh, these bras. Yeah. Uh, and women with large breasts talking about, well, this is what I'm doing and I'm managing kids and this is how I exercise and this is the food I'm eating. And, you know, we're building a whole community. Mm. They just happen to have big boobs and yeah. they just happen to buy our bras. Yeah. And it's a real pain point. It you is. Know, it actually is quite painful. It, it is really, it really is an issue for anyone that's too sporty and, and, it, and it's to, to solve that problems. a no brainer. It yeah. really is. Yeah. So that was a great option. Yeah. But it's all about then how we market it because <clears> anyone else can solve the problem. They can still make bras in different sizes that are high quality, yep. but this is what we want this brand to be known for, that yep. they're supporting women who are doing these types of sports yep. who, you know, have big boobs. Yep. Mm. And when we start to build a community around that, we're starting to, and this is what I love about brand archetypes, is that we're not selling off features and benefits that yep. our customers or our competitors, um, that our competitors can copy. We're building uh, a culture, we're building mm. uh, an understanding, yep. we're building the story that is like I call it the death by a thousand cuts. It's the 101 things you do as a brand. If you think about um, this bra brand, you know, it's the community, it's the stories we're sharing, the types of photos we do, the types mm. of activities we show them doing. It's 101 things that a competitor just can't copy. Yeah. Because it's not price driven. Yeah, sure. And then, it, and then it just happens to cost this much. Of course, you're going to invest in that if you want to feel supported. Yeah. yeah. Held, not held back. So this is this is quite tied in with the neuro neuro marketing, is. really, it, isn't it? It's actually I of it's all the neuro marketing of all the neuro marketing um, techniques or strategies that we apply, archetypes is the deepest version of it because yeah. it 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 applies through everything yeah. through language, really internally specific. through culture. Yeah. Uh, it drives packaging. It drives the underlying. It it is the underlying emotional response yeah, that yeah. taps into that human yeah, need that right. we've established. Yeah. And then we're literally telling the story standing on that stage. And again, as I said, as in a person, you know, we all relate to the person. Yeah. So we personify the brand as a person and then we know all the good bits about them and we know all the bad bits about them. So then we can make just brand and market marketing decisions based on what we know about that. So mm. we can avoid some of the traps. A lot of products, it strikes me, would have a lot of attributes from either. Like, you know, a lot of the products we do, which are new, would have the sage, you know, educational, because it's a new product, it has to be education about, e e educational program about it. The ruler, because they're new and innovative, they've got to, they've got to be at the top and say, well, here I am, I'm, I'm now changing the game, so here's the new rules. Um, rebel, you know, obviously disruptive, so they've got to be the rebel as well. Um, you have to make a decision, I imagine, you can't just cross over between, so that must be quite hard to do. Well, that's what, so we, we do that in a, we do a four hour workshop where we really pull that out. So what is the most important thing that you want to own or be known for? Mm. So again, you look at the competitive landscape, you look at how you actually will um, deal with your, your customers or potential customers. So if you're a bank and you say, oh, I'm a caregiver, uh, and but as soon as you default on your loan, I'm going to take your house away. <laughs> like a caregiver brand wouldn't do that. So no. we've got to then validate against, well, what are we actually comfortable in, yep. in yep. offering? Yep. But I, I do make you narrow down on one, and this is where we need to go deeper. So what's already expected? Mm. So if you're a hospital or if you're a doctor, I'm not going to let you be a caregiver because yeah. I already expect as a minimum, you're going to take good care of me. Yeah. Yeah. And so you want to even take that off the table. Yeah. So what, but what, what does a, a wizard hospital look like? Or what does a, a rebel, you know, hospital look like? And yeah. so how are they doing things that are different? And that's where you start to then question, well, what's the most important thing that we can own? Mm. We did a, um, we did a pest service. So they, you know, you know, the little man that comes around and sprays your cockies and that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, we positioned him as a sage because mm he wanted to own the information. So he was basically, he's doing world domination, suburb by suburb. Right. So he goes into each suburb and he collects the information. So now this becomes part of his business process around the sage. 
you know, when he, he might own The Gap, for example, which is in Brisbane. So he goes to that suburb and he does 50 to 100 houses in that and he's collecting, well, how much, you know, is he seeing rats, how many cockroaches, you know, ah. what sort of, is there termites? He's collecting the data database, in yeah. the area. Who else is then interested in that data? Yep. Real estate agents. Yeah, okay. So then he's actually got a saleable thing. Well, he could say, well, if you're in The Gap, we're the experts of The Gap because we've done this many houses, we know what to look for, you know, there's 59%, you know, have termites and, you know, yeah. so he actually can own and that's his point of difference yeah, when he's right. marketing. Good. And that's where the sage would work for him. Whereas another pest business might say, well, you know what? When you find a possum in your roof or you've got really bad cockroaches, we really want to be that person that comes and saves the day for you. So as a hero brand, we're going to, you know, our business is, we're going to say this yep. type of thing. This Lights is our service and our process in. is going to be based on, you know, 24 hour, seven day a week type service. Yep. And yep. we're going to, you know, Come Arrive. come over the hill in fifteen minutes to save the day. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, so that um, it you know it, they can still fundamentally doing the same service. We've yeah. just positioned them differently wow. based on what our brains already know about those particular characters yeah. or archetypes. Yeah. So there's a level of finding out the options you've got from from a product's perspective or a company's perspective, and then looking at the landscape around it and then positioning it according to what's going to work. Yes, interesting stuff. Yeah. Excellent. So you like have playing really... to what's already familiar. That's that's really what this is about, isn't it? Yeah, mm. yeah. Don't try and reinvent the wheel. Mm. I mean, you were saying before you've got clients that are trying to innovate. Yes, but what are they trying to innovate, and are they trying to do it? Is it is it purely disruptive, yeah. or can they really lead with you know uh, transforming, which is the wizard? You know, are they transforming yeah. a thought, yeah. or are they leading the charge? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's excellent stuff. All right. Well, if for more information on brand archetypes, as we said before. Go and talk to Belinda Issy Brown. She's got a wealth of information. This is, as again, just scratching the surface because we just don't have the time, um, and the audience doesn't have the time to watch these long, long interviews. No. So, so look, there's so much information on the um, on the Brandonian website about this sort of stuff. Um, it's even this information here, the little video that I watched before we came in here, and it's just it, it sort of goes through all the different types. There's obviously more to it. You've obviously got to take find out who the what your your archetype is for your business um, and then obviously look at them look at the landscape of the market and try and fit that into a spot that you're comfortable with so thank you again Belinda it's been thank great this later. series has been fantastic I think people are gonna get a lot of information out of it really really useful stuff and um, yeah look uh, we're, we're probably gonna tap into more of the resource if you don't mind just <sighs> Yes. Yeah. Get grabbing and again if you later think I can help, track. I'd love to help. Yeah, for sure. You've talked about pictures and things, so that's yes. a very important one as well for us. So we might even um, even talk to, talk a bit more about what we can what we can gather out of that big brand of yours. Yes. Thanks, Thanks John. Again. I always feel good talking to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Hamish. You've been listening to Off to Market with Scott Farley and Hamish Chadwick.